What's up, everyone? Long time no here. And I wanted to talk about this today because someone mentioned it to me in the comment section, and I thought it was quite interesting, a topic to cover being that my ICOC spiritual birthday just passed on May 31st. So let's get into it. First, let me welcome everyone to the video, to the channel. And if you're here, I'm going to assume that you have some experience with spiritual abuse, religious abuse, spiritual trauma. I'm going to also assume you were a former member of a cult or an abusive church or organization. And I also will assume that a lot of you are former members or current members of the ICOC or the Boston movement or the ICC uh, Christian cult churches. And you can relate to this, but if you weren't part of any of those groups, if you were a Jehovah's witness or a part of assemblies of God or any other, any other abusive religious organization, you can relate to this as well. I know, of course, some like Jehovah's Witnesses, I believe, is, that don't celebrate birthdays. So, you know, but for whoever this is for, then hopefully this is beneficial to you in some way, right? Uh, a quick introduction, if you're new here, uh, that I am an ex-member of the International Church of Christ. I was a member for almost 12 years. I left back in 2006. And I talk about my experiences. I talk about uh, spiritual abuse and cult and recovery and my own journey um, to healing and wholeness. And I always say it's a journey, not a destination. So with all that out the way, you know, welcome. Um, and I'm talking about spiritual birthdays because like I said, mine passed recently, May 31st. And it's not something that emotionally triggers me. It's not very emotionally charged for me. For some of you, it might be. So I wanted to talk about this topic because everyone processes things differently. Everyone who is a cult survivor, an ex-member, they experience different aspects of it in a different way. A spiritual birthday can be traumatizing for some people. It could be triggering. And, and that's totally understandable. But for me, for some reason, it's something that is forever etched in my memory. So when May 31st rolls around, I always remember it in my mind. It, it, it is like a thought pops up and it goes, oh, today's the 31st, the day I was baptized. It's not something, it's just a factual thought. It's not an emotionally charged thought. It's not something that makes me tear up or makes me angry or or depressed or anxious. It's just, just a date that I remember. I remember, I remember so much about that day. And for many of you, I'm, you probably can relate that the day you were baptized is a day that you will never forget for good, bad, or indifferent. I remember, for example, the mixture of fear and an adrenaline rush. It's like a sense of excitement mixed with trauma. I remember at that point when I was getting baptized, it was at 
a midweek service, a Wednesday night service. And at that point I had counted the cost and did the counting the cost study, which, which was completely, you know, a traumatizing experience. And I write about it on my blog. I'll put the link in the description because I talk about what happened and, and I consider it to be spiritual rape. What happened to me at that day. So the day I got baptized, I had a mix of all these emotions and I had bought the Kool-Aid. I mean, I had really, at that point, at the very end of the studies, I was, I was right where they wanted me to be. The studies, the Bible studies and the ICOC, the first principle studies that everyone has to do to be initiated into the church are designed to break you down and to instill in you the ideology of the church and their interpretation of God and of the Bible. And they really had me afraid that if I died before I got into that baptism water, that I was going to go to hell. And so I was terrified. I remember they were, they were pressuring me to get baptized the day before, right after the counting the cost study. And I said, no, I, I didn't want to do it right then and there. We were in the, the house of the women's ministry leader and her husband. And she wanted me to get baptized in her bathtub upstairs. And I said, no. And you know, if you're familiar with the ICOC, you're aware of how how much they emphasize urgency and being urgent to get right with God and be saved. And so when I said no, they were very disappointed and they thought I wasn't really urgent, but they said, okay, you can do it tomorrow. You know, and they would, they made jokes. I remember the girl who recruited me and studied with me, she was there and she was, um, she, I remember she was making jokes about hopefully I won't die before I get baptized. And, you know, reflecting on these kinds of things is crazy because you think that's not funny. It's, it's not funny at all. Uh, what is wrong with you people? But there's a lot wrong. And at the time, you know, I'm an 18 year old kid. I didn't know any better. I got caught up in this whole thing and and that's what cults do. And so the mind control had taken root. And I remember we were driving on our way to midweek service for the baptism. And everyone was in a tizzy, rushing around, trying to get everything ready. You know, there's all this perfunctory that has to go on before to get baptized. So they got to get the tub. They got to get, you know, all that set up. And I remember all that happening in the background. I remember we were driving to church. One of the girls that I was sleeping over her house. It's a, it's a bit of a story about this whole thing, but the long, the short end of it is that um, where I lived, there wasn't an actual ICOC ministry. There were only a few disciples there. So we, you know, drove two and a half hours to the nearest church, the full ministry church that had staff and everything. So I was two hours, two and a half, almost three hours, you know, driving to, to, to this church. So I was staying with some of the sisters in the church at their house while I was, you know, counting the costs and doing the remainder of the studies. And so once I was approved to be baptized, um, you know, we, one of the sisters had a car and she, we, we left her house and was driving the, to the midweek service. It was at this elementary school. And I just remember how reckless she was driving. It was like a car, a little hatchback. We were all packed in. I was scrunched in the back with, you know, the, the woman who had recruited me. 
and they were hammering me with questions about, you know, so if, if this scenario happens, what would you do? Would you stand up for God? Would you not stand up for God? Like they were hitting me with these last minute questions to make sure that I was really ready. That I was really sold out. And I remember she said to me, if someone put a gun to your head and said to deny Jesus, the Jesus is Lord, would you, would you die? Would you, would you die? And it was such an intense moment. Like it was so serious. And as she was saying it to me, the car swerved and we almost hit a truck. It was crazy. And it, and everyone after, after the car got, you know, after we, we got back straight again and, you know, and we, we continued to drive, everyone in the car was laughing like, whoo, we're lucky about that. You're not, you're not baptized yet. And, and so again, it's really not funny. I just remember being terrified and, and sweating bullets. Like, I hope we make it there. God, please let us get there. Please let us get there. But she asked me, you know, would I die? Well, if someone put a gun to my head, would I say, would I deny Jesus? And she read the scripture about, you know, what Jesus says, those who deny me, I will deny him on judgment day. And so I was just in complete terror. And, and I, I said, yes. And, and I remember in that moment, this feeling rising up in me, like, yes, I am willing to die. And I said, yes. And so, you know, they, they believe me because of course they have to believe what you're saying and, you know, approve it. And all this is happening in real time and, and you know, in, in high definition as we're speeding down the road, going to church, almost swerving, hitting another car, you know, and so all this is happening. And it was just a, it was just a major adrenaline, adrenaline rush. And finally, you know, after service or toward the end, I think, you know, I was brought out on stage in front of about 200, 300 people. And, you know, and I got into the water and that was, you know, my spiritual birthday, you know, and I remember getting out of the water and I remember how everyone treated me so differently. Like before I was an outsider and now everyone was walking up to me, hugging me saying, welcome sis, welcome sis, welcome to the kingdom sis, I was sis now. And you know, it's like, you're, you're part of the family now, you're part of us now, you know? Um, so I remember that feeling of absolute relief that I was finally saved, that I was out of danger of going to hell and I think someone had actually said that to me, like, you know, if you die now, I mean, you're good. And I remember someone else said to me, while I was still wet, my hair was still dripping. I was, I was, had a towel wrapped around me. And I remember her saying, you know, for the rest of your life now, the only reason you're alive is to give God glory and to bring other people to Christ, to seek and save the lost. And and that was it. But I don't have a whole lot to say about this. I, I'm interested to hear other people's experiences with a spiritual birthday. Like, do you think about your spiritual birthday? Do you even remember yours? You know, it, does it bring up any emotions for you? For me, it doesn't. But I always remember the date. I always, you know, think of it. But, you know, there's no nostalgia. There's no, there's no necessarily tr triggering of a trauma. Even though it was traumatic, it was all the things I just told you about. But I think at this point in my life, it's just a sense of relief. It's a sense of relief that I'm not in the ICOC anymore. It's a sense of relief that I'm free. It's a sense of relief that I have come up on the other side of a very long spiritual existential journey that I had to take alone, that we all have to take alone. 
to get to a place where you find you find a sense of peace where you can be grounded you know and my life is far from perfect and nor will it ever be but i'll tell you one thing you know i am grounded and i know what i believe i know who i am now and i could never say that back then i can never say that you know those experiences made me a better person or those experiences you know like my spiritual birthday you know was this i don't know um this landmark of event in my life it was only significant in the sense that now I was accepted by the church but it's not the day i was spiritually born the day i was spiritually born was when i left the icoc and that's facts and i would dare to say the same for you if you're listening to this you, they tell you you're born again but you aren't when you leave is when you become born again if you can get yourself free from all the indoctrination and the religion and the bible and all of these things that we're taught and the way that is interpreted to us and and everything connected with that if you can get free from that and deconstruct it and come back with your own your own relationship with god or your own relationship with yourself you know that you've figured out your real authentic beliefs then i'd say that's when i was born again i felt i was my spirit truly came alive when i began to dive deep and to really learn me and to really face the truth within myself but when you're living a truth from other people and from ancient religious texts and churches and cults and you you're not born again you're dead but you know cheers to life and just new beginnings and the starting over and i wish that for all of you listening to this and so until next time we shall speak again